Sri Parekh believes that access to knowledge is a basic human right. The enlightened use of capital would be to make knowledge available to everyone. That's why we felt that for a man who was enthusiastic about the production and distribution of ideas, a memorial lecture would be an apt tribute. Mr. Parekh was an avid reader of poetry. And like Koshitsky, the synthesizer of the methodology of general semantics, believed that poetry often conveys in a few sentences more of lasting value than a whole volume of scientific analysis. Today, we have a theme tangentially connected to poetry. Professor Hans Alrich Gumbret will speak on what can verse rhyme Tansa do to a text. Professor Hans Ulrich Gumbret is a literary theorist whose work spans philology, philosophy, literary and cultural history, and epistemologies of every day. He is the Albert Girard Professor of Literature in the Department of Comparative Literature of French and Italian, of Spanish and Portuguese, and is affiliated with German studies and the program in modern thought and literature at Stanford University. Over the past 40 years, he has published more than 2,000 texts, including books which have been translated into more than 20 languages. Some of his best-known works include Making Sense in Life and Literature, in 1926, Living at the Edge of Time, Production of Presence, what meaning cannot convey in praise of athletic beauty, atmosphere, mood, stimmung, and after 1945, latency as origin of the present. In Europe and South America, Gumbret has his presence as a public intellectual, whereas in the academic world, he has been acknowledged by nine honorary doctorates in six different countries. He has also held a large number of visiting professorships. Dr. Gumbret is a polyglot, fluent in seven languages. He taught in the 2016 Theory Praxis course of the Forum on Contemporary Theory, and we still fondly remember how enthusiastic the students were about his lectures. He is a man of formidable scholarship and still very friendly, humble, and approachable quite a rare phenomenon in contemporary academics. We welcome you here, Professor Gumbret, and thank you for accepting our invitation. I'm so happy that all of you are here, and I hope that you will continue to support our future endeavors. Please keep your cell phones switched off or in the silent mode. Let's begin the lecture, Professor Gumbret. Thank you for being here. I, I mean, just if you want to, as, as I have a book on presence and like theory of presence, if, if those among you who are sitting in the back come a little bit closer, I, I become a better speaker. And that's really, because then I have the impression that I was surrounded by people. Thank you, that is so kind. I think only in India that happens, because I was saying the same thing to a lecturing audience day before yesterday in Germany, nobody moved. That's <laughs> that's very nice. Uh, thank you also for the introduction and for the very nice personal words. Um, I have to beg to differ on one statement that you were saying uh, that I was humble. That is very nice of you to say that, but my wife has a caustic... My wife has a caustic sentence about me. She reminds me every day by saying modesty is not your main problem. So, I mean, to hear that anybody could react to me as being humble makes me <laughs> really very, very proud. And I will immediately, when I come home tonight to my hotel, I will tell her by email 
that somebody found me humble. That is uh, really, really very generous of you. Now, thanks for inviting me to the uh, Parik uh, lecture this year. If I remember correctly, after uh, the summer of 2016 for a second time, and as I know my friend Prafula, who organizes all of this really well, and I have experienced during our month together in Hyderabad how serious he is about criteria of selection and organizing and not being humble, I would say I probably deservedly uh, have the honor for the second time uh, to give a Parik lecture. So many, many thanks for that, and I really feel honored. Now, two remarks that are very personal, uh, uh, and this has to do with the, the hour and a half that I spent with some of you just before the lecture today. In the first place, there were so many of you who were telling me that they liked the lecture a year and a half ago that uh, I feel a huge weight on my shoulders. Uh, so just bear with the lecture today and don't necessarily compare it to the other one. I mean, I find this one more interesting than the one a year and a half ago, but sometimes in retrospect, um, you know, memories get blown up and get very, very charismatic. So just concentrate on today and don't compare. I also wanted to say that, I mean, if I'm honest, some people were asking me at Stanford, how come you go to India during the Christmas break and uh, I mean, I knew that I wanted to come, but this morning already when Prafula picked me up at the airport and we went to my hotel and I looked over the city and when I went to the Parik Center, we went to the university, I simply had this epiphanic evidence, really, I mean, it's a strong word, epiphanic evidence. I want to be in India and at Baroda today. Yeah? So this is where I want to be today. And this is, you, you know that feeling. This is a terrific feeling when you have this certainty that you cannot explain that during a day or during a time you are at the place where you really want to be. And I want to thank you all for that. I mean, this is, this is a strong feeling. One doesn't have that very often. And uh, that is the feeling from which um, I'll talk today. Now, um, I have to admit, and only Prafula knows that, uh, that he already heard me talk about this topic once because during the summer school we did in Hyderabad in the summer of 2016, there were two lectures by the two teaching professors there, uh, and I talked about prosody under a different title, and I, lack of modesty, I've never given a, a lecture twice in my life, so this is a new lecture about the same topic. But why did I run the risk uh, of boring my friend Prafula with a topic he has already heard me about? Uh, why did I do that? Well, I have a number of reasons, and the number of reasons have to do with how I understand the goal and the spirit uh, of the Parik lectures. I have the impression, but maybe I'm wrong, that they are in the first place about literature or about the spirit of literature. Yeah, I mean. Uh, those departments that were called literary departments in the past 20, 30 years have sometimes lost their boundaries and they have been morphing, they have been transformed into departments of cultural studies and so forth and so forth. That is an interesting opening because it allows for more topics, but, and I've certainly participated in that, but I oftentimes have the feeling in the recent years, I mean like last two, three years, that it would be worthwhile to return to a closer focus on literature, to discuss what we mean when we say literature, what we mean when we say all these beautiful things about literature that normally are very proverbial. Yeah? I mean, we all say, oh, literature is wonderful, and how can it not be wonderful? But And people can be very enthusiastic about literature, but I do think it is very difficult to grasp what is so particularly about literature without being proverbial and banal. Yeah? You get my point? I mean, we all have this certainty, but if you want to explain it, it becomes banal. So in that sense, I felt this could be a focus intended with the Parik lectures to talk about a fundamental question concerning literature and try to not do it in this general uh, banal and proverbial way. That is the first intention. Then secondly, I thought it is worthwhile to talk about an unresolved problem. 
because, I mean, those among you who are not working in literary studies, uh, but most of you probably do work in, how many of you work in literary studies concretely? Only one, only you? Okay. If you're not working in literary studies, uh, you will be astonished to hear me say that the problem uh, of the title of my lecture, in other words, the problem of what is the function of prosody, what is different in the prosodic text and the prose text is completely unresolved. There's absolutely no consensus about this question. I thought this also contributes, attributes to the dignity of the Parik lectures, to not just talk about a question whose answer everybody knows, but to talk about something that's fundamental and at the same time unresolved. That's the second, the second reason why I chose this topic. Thirdly, I think this is uh, part of the genre of endowed lectures. If you invite people, uh, you want to have something of their intellectual flavor, of their intellectual personality. Uh, and I do believe, once again, not humble or not humbly, uh, I do believe that what I have to say about the function of prosody is very much my style. I mean, it may be wrong, but uh, I do think other people will try to approach the topic in a different way. And finally, and most importantly, and I hope you bear with me and participate, I have organized this lecture in a way that it could trigger an encounter between Western cultures and Indian culture. I, of course, am only competent, if competent at all, in a certain range of Western cultures, mainly Romance cultures. Uh, and I do not know whether what I have to say about prosody and the function of prosody can hold for Indian poetry. Yeah? At this point and for the first time, I have a doctoral student from Delhi at Stanford, and she works on, on Indian poetry, so I get an impression about how different that world is. So what I would hope for the discussion, and this would be part of the discussion, we do not just challenge the lecture, to have an impression from you what impact both my thesis and the recitations that I will offer you have on you. Yeah? I will recite several Western poems, German poets in the original language. You have a translation, does everybody have the handout? Yeah? And I'll be very interested to hear what impact that prosody, that prosody of Gottfried Benn, a 20th century German poet, that prosody of Friedrich Hölderlin, arguably the greatest poet of German language ever, will have on you. But not in the sense that it has to fulfill what I'm saying. It would be actually more interesting to hear that it has a different impact on you. So these were um, my reasons to choose this topic, running the risk of boring Prafula, because he hears me talk uh, about the function of prosody for a second time. Now, the menu, the structure, the outline of a lecture has three parts. And this has to do with the title, What Does Prosody Do to a Text? I will, in the first part, briefly talk about text. Because I think normally, when we ask this question, what does prosody do to a text, we are implying that the text which prosody will transform is a literary text, already has a literary quality. As some of you know, this was a real literary exercise uh, in the age of Renaissance in Western cultures uh, to give a poetic version to text that had previously been prosodic text. So in order to ask this question, you have to have a conception of what is literature. But as you will see, or as some of you know, within Western cultures, there is on the one hand a certainty everybody believes he or she knows what literature is, but there's no consensus about that. So we'll briefly talk about that in the first part. And then the second part, that's the main part, I'll talk about the functions of prosody. And that will begin with a proposal for a definition of rhythm. Because I believe that the concept of rhythm is the concept that subsumes, is able to subsume all the phenomena that we are referring to when we talk about prosody. When we talk about verse, when we talk about rhyme, when we talk about stanza, these are all phenomena that have a rhythm. So I'm going to ask the question, what is a rhythm to approach an answer to the question, uh, what are the functions of prosody? And then I will talk about 
uh, three different functions of prosody, not pretending that I will cover the full range of possibilities. The first is the memnotechnical function of prosody. You all know that it is easier to memorize, to retain knowledge that we have structured, that we have stored in our brain, structured in prosodic form. Nobody really knows why this is the case, but everybody knows it happens, and it is a kind of pedagogical tool to give children a certain knowledge in prosody. So that's the first function. The second function of rhythm and of prosody that I want to talk about is body coordination. Yeah, you all know uh, that um, if some knowledge is distributed in prosodic form, it also coordinates bodies, and it sometimes coordinates bodies and convinces people uh, of things that are absolutely untrue. I give you an example. Uh, since the Cuban Revolution, since early Fidel Castro, that there is a prosodic form in Spanish, el pueblo unido jamás será vencido. If the people is united, it is unbeatable, it cannot, it's invincible, it cannot be defeated. I mean, unfortunately, no statement is more untrue than this statement. Yeah? I mean, unfortunately, but it's completely untrue. But if you say this statement, people in prosodic form, if you would say it in prose, I mean, I always say it's nonsense. But if you say it in prosodic form, people march along the lines of that, and people believe it's true. Yeah? I mean, it was remarkable, uh, not only on my campus, but in many campuses at, in the US, that after the Trump election, the first days, students united and were chanting this El Pueblo Unido jamás será vencido, and were walking from one end to the campus to the next, protesting against Trump, not taking into account that the electorate of Trump had been the, I mean, whom I find is a huge embarrassment and horrible, et cetera, et cetera, but it had been the most populous electorate ever in the United States. Yeah? I mean, very poor people voted for Trump. So in that sense, to protest against Trump by saying El Pueblo Unido jamás era mentido was the most nonsensical thing you could do. And I believe it would not have happened had it been a pro sentence. This is not a criticism of a political movement. This is just trying to illustrate this function of body coordination. And thirdly, and most importantly, I think you all know that rhythm and prosodic form has a capacity to conjure up things, to conjure up things to give us the impression that what is semantically evoked in the text has a physical presence. Yeah, it is as if it could conjure up a place. The last poem that I'm going to read you is a poem by Hölderlin uh, on the city, the university town of Heidelberg in Germany. How many of you have ever been to Heidelberg? Uh, one. I, I'm not surprised that you have been to Heidelberg. <laughs> the test would be not if you have an objective image of Heidelberg, but if I read that text to you in German prosody and you have an English translation, whether you have this feeling that Heidelberg stands in front of you. This is not about objective reality, but about the feeling that you are in physical proximity. And in that spirit, once I've talked about this third function of rhythm and prosody, namely about conjuring up, I will end up the lecture by reading you two poems, okay? So experiment, I would hope that, that in the discussion, we will not only discuss my theoretical, philosophical arguments, I hope they are enough to discuss, but that I will also get an impression of you, of the different, of how your basic concept of literature is different, how your basic concept of poetry is different, and I wouldn't consider that a protest against which I've been, what, what I've been saying, uh, but an intellectual enrichment for me. So I start with the uh, first consideration, brief consideration about literature, and of course, as during the entire lecture, I'm talking from a Western point of view. Oh, I forgot to say, uh, and I made the same joke a year and a half ago, uh, once you have said what is the program for a lecture, you have to say how long the lecture is going to take. Uh, for me, this is very, very difficult because I'm always speaking from notes. I never have a text that I read. When I have a text that I read, I feel embarrassed because I already know the text, and I have the feeling you know it too, so I have to speak from notes. Uh, but if you speak from notes, as some of you may know, you depend on the hermeneutic of the faces. I mean, if you feel that 
people are really interested by what you're saying. At least in my case, I get loquacious and it gets very long. And with German audiences who look at you uh, in a very severe way, in a sticky way, uh, I, I get scared and I start skipping things and the lecture is short. So as you are kind enough to laugh my little jokes, I'll probably be a little bit exuberant and the lecture can be long. But even if it's short, the responsibility is always yours. Okay, now, uh, what do we understand in Western cultures and we can talk about Western culture and global culture. Of course, Western culture has a specific status because um, it has expanded so much that in many countries, India is part of it, but the clearest case that I know is Japan, that people can go by culture. You can participate in global culture and you can participate in local culture. But anyway, um, in Western culture, in Western cultural theory, um, most of you know that there's an infinity of proposals to define literature. Partly because since the early 20th century, since the emergence of literary theory, I'm not talking of the emergence of academic literary criticism. I think academic literary criticism, academic literary history emerged as a discipline, as an academic discipline in the early 19th century. But the sub-discipline of literary theory emerged in the early 20th century. And from that moment on, many academics felt that the possibility of literary theory as a sub-discipline depended on having a concept of literature. Yeah? This is the reason why there is such a, I mean, such a plethora of proposals for a meta-historical <coughs> and transcultural definition of literature. I will give you two examples. One which I like very much is by Jean-Paul Sartre from the uh, early 1950s in What is Literature? Qu'est-ce que la littérature? Where he says, literature is a pact of generosity between the author and the reader. I don't go into any detail. And I quote you another famous definition much earlier from Roman Jakobson, from the Opoyats, from this group of young Russian scholars who before the October Revolution tried to constitute literary theory and they constituted Russian formalism which was the first literary theory so they had a definition of literature which was much more quote unquote scientific they said uh, literature is the projection of the axis of, of the paradigmatic axis of equivalence to the syntactic axis I will not even explain that I mean, I also don't believe that either of these definition functions, but I could go on and on and on and give an entire lecture series on the history of definitions of literature uh, within literary theory. So there is absolutely no consensus. But at the same time, and that is interesting, and that would be my first question, is this the same in the Indian situation? Cultivated people, not only uh, literary scholars, use the word uh, literature quite a lot. And they use the word with a certainty that they know what they are talking about without being able to define what they're talking about. And this, if you're not a professional, is a good enough situation. Yeah? I mean, you talk with somebody, you talk about literature, you're presupposing a certain meaning. You don't have to reconstruct this meaning as long as communication functions. And here's my hypothesis about what components this tacitly consensual concept of literature has in the Western world. I think there are three components, and the first component is romantic. I mean, romantic in the sense comes out of the historical period of romanticism, early 19th century. Uh, that component presupposes uh, that literary texts are those texts who fulfill the difficult task to articulate in a medium that is necessarily social, namely language, something which is exceedingly personal. Yeah, this is what the romantic poet somehow manages to do, something that is only hers or his to articulate it, to make it open, accessible to others. 
in that sense, the etymology of the word expression, and I think expression is the key concept for romantic poetry, is interesting, because believe it or not, the first uh, expression didn't exist as a Latin word. There is no word expressio in Latin. Uh, the word appears first in Martin Luther when he translates the Bible, and it is a metaphor from delivery, from bringing to, from from producing a child. Yeah, so this is precisely the birth pangs, the difficulty, the pain of bringing to the world that child is a metaphor for the difficulty to articulate your most innermost thoughts in a text. Yeah, and I think this meaning of literature, uh, this excessively, exceedingly uh, personal thing that comes into language, that is a first connotation that we have when we talk about literature with the implication that if literature expresses the most personal thoughts, it is always in a tension with society. Not in a political tension necessarily, but what is being expressed in literature can, ne can never be mainstream in society, can never be central in society. Is that clear? I mean, once again, I don't think that people who use the word competently would know that, but that is one connotation they have. And this connotation comes from the 19th century. A second connotation, uh, I think, has to do with the uh, 20th century uh, and with the impression that truly great literature, I would call it hyper-canonized literature, so canonized that none of these authors ever won a Nobel. And this is not only ironic, because, of course, in order to win a Nobel, you have to create a consensus at the Swedish Academy, um, whose literary taste is not always the best and whose political obligations are obvious. So I think none of the greatest literary authors of the 20th century ever won a Nobel. Yeah, I mean, I feel they are what we call in Stanford average excellence. They're very, very good, like Thomas Mann, for example, in Germany, et cetera, et cetera, but the greatest ones I will name you some of them, never got a Nobel. Think, for example, of Marcel Proust. Uh, think of James Joyce. <coughs> think for the German language of an Austrian author, Robert Musil. <coughs> think for Brazilian literature, for example, I don't know whether you know the name of Guimarães Rosa, the author of a fantastic, fantastic epic or novel under the title Grandes Certains Veredas. Uh, think for American literature of Thomas Pynchon. I mean, interesting. I mean, Pynchon is not a candidate for the Nobel. He will never get the, the Nobel. But there is no text comparable. I mean, maybe Faulkner is one of the all-time greats who got a Nobel. Never uh, did get a Nobel. But you get my point. There is a second connotation today that literature has a risk of being exceedingly difficult. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting in that sense that uh, the, the work that follows Ulysses in Joyce's production is Finnegan's Wake, which is quite literally unreadable. And yet, when you try to make it through Finnegan's Wake, which is literally impossible, you get an impression that there is ultimate greatness. So this is a second connotation, and a relatively new connotation, that uh, literature can be absolutely prohibitively difficult, to which within Western cultures there's a counter-movement, and that is quite interesting, and that counter-movement is the so-called boom of the South American novel in the third quarter of the 20th century. If you think, for example, of my only example for one of the greatest texts of the 20th century that got a Nobel, a Hundred Years of Solitude by Garcia Marquez. That is an exceedingly readable text. Yeah? That is a text where you're really sad when it's over. You want to have more and more and more. Uh, so you get my point. There is a tension. Yeah? This is the second connotation. It's exceedingly difficult, but maybe not necessarily so difficult. But that also belongs what people imply when they talk about literature. The third connotation um, is a historical one that you have to be a specialist to know about, uh, but I think that is part of the concept of literature. And that is the fact that in most Western national literatures, uh, the most canonized texts, the texts that embody 
what literature is supposed to be are texts from around 1600. Yeah? I mean, I'll actually immodestly, no humility, uh, claim uh, that nobody has seen that before. But I'll give you a couple of examples. So for France, for example, it is Corneille Racine Molière. Yeah? These are the archie canonized texts. And that is starting with Corneille, early 17th and the mid 17th century. Uh, for Spain, that is Cervantes Lope de Vega Calderón. That is also early 17th century. For Portuguese literature, uh, it is Camões, and it is Padre Vieiras. Padre Vieiras was a um, Jesuit preacher. That sounds very bad, but who had a capacity of prose that I find is 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 unequaled, actually, in Western literatures. Also, <coughs> 17th century, and for England, I only say one name, Shakespeare. Nothing is comparably canonized. So this is all around 1600. It is not the case in Italy. Um, Italy's most canonized uh, literature are the three crowns, uh, Dante, Boccaccio, Petrarch. Uh, that is actually 14th century. And it's not true for German literature. <coughs> the most canonized German literature is late 18th century, which has to do with the fact that Germany didn't exist <coughs> in the 17th century, and that the territory uh, of German language was occupied in the 17th century by the so-called Thirty Years' War. This was not a moment for literary production. But in general, as a general rule, you could say, uh, this moment after 1600 is foundational for what we call national literatures in Western culture. Now, how could one explain that? And I'm speculating. Uh, I speculate that it has to do with a secular modality of producing a world. A secular modality of producing a world. I mean, in Shakespeare's world, around 1600, uh, the proposal of the world that was theological, that was Christian, that was religious, <coughs> was clearly no longer generally accepted. It was shared by most people, but secularization was the law. Now, what is a world? I think, and I'm using actually a metaphor by a doctoral student of mine, who wrote a fantastic dissertation about the Iliad, which will be published by Chicago University Press soon, in which he tries to argue that the Iliad is not only the epic uh, that creates the Greek world, but it is the first text that creates a world at all. So that preceding the Iliad, there is no world. What is a world? Well, a world is a construction that stitches, and take the metaphor seriously, together different ontological realms. Persons, things, nature, spirit, you name it. It's endless, but they are stitched together. There's no common denominator, but they are some, somehow stitched together. Yeah, that would be the secular creation of a world would be the function of literature. And when we say literature, we imply that too. So <coughs> this is not a definition that I'm giving you. I'm trying to reconstruct what we mean in Western culture when we say literature <coughs> without a definition, but with a certainty. And I think we, we, we assume with certainty <coughs> that it is in the first place exceedingly subjective in the second place, caught in an oscillation between exceedingly difficult and exceedingly assess accessible, and perhaps above all, involved in a creation of world. Yeah? I mean, not in the sense that they're all converging, creating the same world, but we read literature as a proposal of that stitching together, uh, which is a world. OK, so much rather as an impulse for you to think about the question how you, with a different cultural background, would describe, not define, uh, your concept of literature about literature, about this concept. But now about uh, poetry. I mean, when people are pressed to define literature, 
And what I'm talking about so far was not about definition, it wasn't about a cultural implication. To define literature, there's always a tendency to use prosodic text, poetic text, to define literature. Why is this the case? Well, because they have visible markers. Yeah? Already the layout of a text on a page looks different from other pages. You can say, oh, poems are literature. They sound differently. So um, oftentimes when people, when sitting pe pe to people next in an airplane and they know these, then they see Stanford University and they find me very interesting because I'm associated with Stanford and they ask me, what do you teach at Stanford? I tell them what I'm teaching and they're normally very disappointed. Uh, in one case, actually, I was saying comparative literature. I'm teaching comparative literature. Oh, very interesting. You're teaching computer literature. No, no, comparative literature. But those who don't lose interest once they know that I'm talking literature want to talk about poetry with me because they immediately associate the scientific approach uh, to literature with poetry. And the one question that they would, of course, all assume I have an answer to is the question, what's the function of poetic form? What's the function of prosody? And I would say the scandal of literary criticism is that we have no answer to this question. And we have many answers to this question, but no binding answer to this question. The scandal of literary theory is a quote. I mean, in Western culture, there is a talk about the scandal of philosophy. What is the scandal of philosophy? That philosophy has not made any measurable progress, let's say, since Plato or since the pre-Socratics. Yeah? So in that sense, in this ironic sense also, the scandal of literary criticism, literary theory, is that it has never produced a good answer to the most obvious question uh, that you may have about literary text, namely, what is the function of prosody? I mean, you all know some standard answers that are not really, that don't hold water. I mean, the answer, for example, of overdetermination. Yeah? So presupposing that um, the semantics of texts are very confused and confusing, and then you use prosody to emphasize, to give semantic contours. Yeah? I mean, that is a little bit stupid, because you would say, well, why didn't the author write more clearly in the first place? Yeah? I mean, why is he producing this chaotic semantics and then uses prosody to, to clarify it? I don't know about India, in the, in the European school system, specifically in Germany, there is another presupposition, namely that there is a quote-unquote correspondence between content and prosodic form. Yeah? I mean, when we had an assignment in the gymnasium in Germany to write about poetry, you knew right from the start that at the end you had to prove that the content would correspond to the form. Um, Frankly, I think philosophically that's nonsensical because uh, the form and the content are ontologically different. There can be no correspondence, or there can be any kind of correspondence. They cannot correspond. They belong to two different realms. That is uh, not an answer. So to get into the mood for uh, the question and to really restart the question, don't presuppose any answers. I will read you what is my favorite poem of the Western canon. It's the only canon I know, which shows that my taste is not very sophisticated because everybody knows that. And that is Sonnet 18 by Shakespeare. And I will presuppose uh, that the content is conventional. Yeah, I mean, it is a poem about uh, a young man. There are all kinds of speculations who that young man was, who is so beautiful that the poetic first person singular hopes that this beauty can transcend the erosion of time, that it will last forever. I mean, that is a pious wish, uh, but it's not very original. I mean, I think you cannot claim that uh, Sonnet 18 is as fabulous as it is, and as I find it, I've never recited Poet 18 without getting goose flesh. Yeah, I think it is absolutely fantastic. But it can definitely, in that case, not be the content. The content could not be more conventional. And yet, it has something very specific, and I'm reading that to you so that we 
engage in a joint intellectual operation and would be to find out what makes it so peculiar. I mean, if you share that feeling, maybe not, and um, forgive my non-native speaker reading of Senate Sonnet 18. You have it in your handout, and I will then come to another text. Uh, yeah, have you, do you have all have it in front of you? Yeah. Shall I compare thee to a summer stay? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a day. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as man can breathe, or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Yeah, I mean, I would, as a starting point, uh, I hope that you all or some of you share with me this enthusiasm for, for the beauty of this poem, but the emphasis it cannot reside in the content. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the content, but it's not particularly original or innovative or anything like that. Nor is the prosody innovative, and yet uh, it has something very, very particular. And to get um, philosophically into this question, uh, I want to share another text with you, and that is a text um, by a very, very much admired late colleague of mine, Richard Rorty, to talk in a very American uh, way when he died in 2005, uh, he was, together with Jacques Derrida, the most frequently quoted philosopher in the world. I mean, he was certainly an important philosopher. He spent his last uh, 10 years at uh, Stanford of his academic career, and I'm also proud to say he was for 10 years my next door neighbor. So uh, I live in the same street, Peter Kutz Circle 84, where Richard Rorty's widow is now living in 85. So this was, I mean, what I'm telling you about in this short text gets very close to me because it took place in the house next to my house. So Richard Rorty, uh, like his friend, close friend Jacques Derrida, indeed, although their philosophies don't have to do much with each other, uh, was diagnosed pancreas cancer the same week uh, that Jacques Derrida was uh, diagnosed pancreas cancer. Uh, Rorty made the very caustic Rorty commentary that comes from reading too much Heidegger, that you get inoperable <laughs> inoperable ca pancreas cancer. Uh, wrote he was teaching pretty much till the latest day. He knew that uh, he would die. Uh, he was relatively unimpressed. I mean, he had nothing heroic about himself, so he wouldn't say, oh, you know, I'm facing death or so. But the anecdote that he tells here, and I will, of course, not read you the entire text, that's the latest published text uh, by Richard Rorty, posthumously. Um, at some point, a relative, a remote relative of his who was a Baptist minister. I mean, Rorty had a very strange relation with religion. He was old-fashioned enough to declare himself an atheist, not an agnostic, but an atheist. But his wife, Mary Rorty, was and still is a practicing Mormon, I mean, which is quite something. But this was a very, very, very beautiful couple, very, very close relationship. Um, and... Um, uh, then, all of a sudden, there he has a relative who is a Baptist minister. Yeah? I mean, if he's a Baptist minister, what, what happens? Yeah? A Baptist minister, a, ba a Baptist minister is the worst, you can say, in terms of religion in American society. And as a Baptist minister who is his cousin, when he travels to California to talk with him. And the Baptist minister asks him, so whether late in his life uh, there are any texts... Uh, that are now becoming important for him. And of course, the Baptist minister wants him to say the Bible or some religious text. And so that you get an impression of Richard Rorty, um, I'll read you that passage. It's the fourth paragraph in the text we have. Um, I was diagnosed with inoperable pancreatic cancer. Some months after I learned the bad news, 
Um, I was sitting around having coffee with my elder son and a visiting cousin. That's the house next to, me, to mine. My cousin, who is a Baptist minister, asked me whether I had found my thoughts turning towards religious topics, and I said no. Just it's very rote, he just said no. Well, what about philosophy, my son asked. No, I replied, neither the philosophy I had written nor that which I had read seemed to have any particular bearing on my situation. I had no quarrel with Epicurus's argument that it is irrational to fear death, nor with Heidegger's suggestion that ontotheology originates in an attempt to evade our mortality. But neither ataraxia, freedom from disturbance, nor sein zum Tode, being toward death, uh, seemed in point. And then uh, both his son and the minister asked him, but are there any texts? that now that you're dying, you regret you haven't read more. And then Rorty says, yeah, nursery rhymes. And I mean, not, I mean, texts that whose only identity is prosody. And he quotes two texts, you can read that at home, that are not very glorious. Um, and then he's asking himself, what is so important about this text? I mean, he was saying, I wish I had memorized more prosodic texts. That's his answer. And then he gives the first answer why, and this is on the next page. I found comfort in those slow meanders and those stuttering embers. And the stuttering is serious. This was not great poetry that he was reciting by heart. I suspect that no com comparable effect could have been produced by prose. Not just imagery, but also rhyme and rhythm were needed to do the job. So rhyme and rhythm were needed to do the job. In lines such as these that he's quoting, all three conspire to produce a degree of compression and thus of impact that only verse can achieve. Compared to the, char to the shaped charges contrived by versifiers, even the best prose is scattershot. I mean, this is a pretty good explanation, but I think it's still very rhetorical. Yeah, I mean, condensation is the thing of poetry. I mean, I just saw, well, no, you quoted, actually, in the introduction, a quote that poetry sometimes can say more in a few lines than a novel. By the way, there are people leaving the, the, the hall more and more. I hope I'm not that boring, so please bear with me. I'm doing my best. Um, but anyway, you get my point. I mean, condensation, yes, it's true for some poetry but it cannot be the formula. So Rorty goes on in his own reflection and comes to the final paragraph, and uh, this is uh, where I want to go, where he says, you have the final paragraph? I now wish that I had spent somewhat more of my life with verse. This is not because I fear having missed out on truth that are incapable of statement in prose. There are no such truth, and I agree with him. There is nothing about death that Swinburne and Lander knew, but Epicurus and Heidegger failed to grasp. Rather, it is because I would have lived more fully if I had been able to rattle off more old chestnuts, just as I would have if I had more close friends, cultures with which our vocabularies are more fully human, um, than those with poorer ones. Individual men and women are more fully human when their memories are amply stocked with verses. So the answer in the end is an existential answer, or if you want an existentialist answer. It's not a rhetorical answer. I would have read a fuller life, not so much having read more poetry, but having learned more poetry by heart having been able to recite poetry. Yeah, I find this in its simplicity. It is a very, very interesting answer. And what I will do now in the next half hour, trying to develop three functions of poetry, my converging point, and I will come back to this point, will always be the question, what can that mean, a fuller life thanks to poetry? Okay, That is my, my key question. Why did Rorty say his life would have been a full alive without poetry. Okay, that's, are we all on this uh, perspective? So I would start with a 
definition of rhythm. I've already said I believe that rhythm as a concept is the common denominator uh, of all the descriptions that we associate with prosody or poetic form. And I give you this definition which at first sounds prohibitively complex but I will articulate it in a way that it is relatively easy. So I think whenever we talk about rhythm it is one of those words that we all use competently without having a definition. Uh, that whenever we talk about rhythm, we practically talk about a solution to the problem. We talk about a solution to the problem. How can a time object in the proper sense have a form? So if you want to write that down, it would be once again the question, how can a time object in the proper sense, have a form. Yeah, so what do I mean by time object in the proper sense? I mean, one of the philosophers who spend a lot of time thinking about that would be Edmund Husserl. When he says uh, time objects are objects who only unfold their phenomenology in temporality, language, for example. I mean, language cannot unfold uh, without time, or, or music or anything we call movement, or more complicated, what we call history. All these things are phenomena that only unfold in time. But we, are, I mean, we realize that they are, of course, phenomena uh, that are not time objects in the sense proper. Sculptures, for example. Sculptures do not unfold in time. Sculptures, as we sometimes say, freeze a moment, or artifacts. I mean, this microphone one day may have a moment of decay but when we think microphone, we don't think about that. Is that clear? So time object in the sense proper. Now, what is a form? Uh, there's an endless market of definitions in philosophy. Uh, I'm using my favorite, my favorite definition of form is by a German philosopher of the late 20th century, Niklas Luhmann, L-U-H-M-A-N-N, who is more worth reading than he is widely known. Uh, Niklas Luhmann. Luhmann says, and this is again one of those definitions that sounds prohibitively complicated, but it's relatively easy to grasp. Um, uh, he says, form is the unity of the difference between outside reference and inside reference. So form is the unity of the difference between outside reference and inside reference or self-reference. Now, what does he mean? Imagine a circle. No, I mean, a circle inevitably, a circle, what we call a form, a circle inevitably points to itself and the rest of the world. No? By, by being a form, it makes a distinction between itself and the rest of the world. Now, this is only true, we would only consider it a form uh, if we consider the circle to be stable. Yeah? Imagine uh, when the circle morphs into a quadrangle and the quadrangle morphs into a different geometrical form and so on and so on, we would no longer call it a form. So this is the question, really. Is that clear? Uh, how can a time object, in the sense proper, something that is constitutively temporal, have a form? Impossible. I mean, I got the answer in one of those banal situations. Um, you know, you all know when you get into a plane and you have to wait um, because people take endless minutes to put their, their luggage in the overhead bin and to get into their seats. So this is right after entering the plane. I had it this morning, was endless on my flight from Mumbai to Baroda, took almost more time. Lufthansa planes at that point have a screen for people to spend time. And in 2000, there was an expo in Hannover in Germany and they had the logo of the expo and this was a strange logo because I said it's not a logo it was a logo that was morphing it had a form and then it morphed into a different form it morphed into a different form and so on and so on uh, however I was waiting long enough in front of the logo to realize that after 38 seconds it went back to the first form and went through the same movements again, and went to the same movements again and again and again. And that's what we call a rhythm. You realize, I mean, a rhythm 
uh, is a transformation of form whose sequence repeats itself so that the structure of the sequence uh, substitutes, replaces the stability of a form normally. Is that clear? So in that sense, everything that is a solution of the problem, how can a time object in the proper sense have a form, is what we call a rhythm. Is that clear to everybody? Because that's the basis of the rest of what I'm doing. I mean, maybe you don't emphatically confirm that it is clear because it is so simple that you think there has to be a trick. I mean, think of that logo. You all know such forms. That is exactly what we call a rhythm. That's also a rhythm in a dance. Yeah? I mean, we may have varieties, but the thing about, I mean, I'm horrible. I mean, the thing I would like the most to be able to be good at in my life is dancing, and I'm an embarrassingly bad dancer. But I would like to be a good dancer. I would like to have this capacity to come back to go through the same sequences. Yeah? I'm one of those who had dancing courses at the German gymnasium. We learned the waltz by counting one, two, three, one, two, three, one. Uh, once you count, it doesn't really happen. But you get the point about, about a rhythm. OK. So that means uh, what we call a rhythm, what we call prosody, is temporality that has a form. Is temporality that has a form. Now let's switch to the first function uh, of prosody, the first function that we associate with prosody, uh, and that is the memnotechnical function. Yeah? I will give you two examples. Is there anybody who knows Latin? Nobody knows Latin? Interesting. So uh, when I was in first grade gymnasium in 1958 in the fall, we learned Latin grammar rules. Among them, the prepositions with ablative. Ablative is the sixth case in Latin. Yeah? And I learned it in a rhyme and with memory, and I will sing it for you. It goes, A, E, D, cum sine, pro, and pre. So these are six words, three prepositions that go with the ablative. Or I can just um, um, irregular uh, nouns that are feminine, that shouldn't be feminine according to their ending, but are feminine. So the as, the x, the aus, the ist, er ist in paris syllabus und es davor ein Konsonant, die werden weibliche genannt. I mean, even if I had forgotten any Latin, I will die, and if on my deathbed somebody's asking me prepositions with ablative, I'll be able to reproduce prepositions with ablative. Nothing is more dysfunctional in my life, but you all know such cases. You know, something you have learned younger or older you will not forget it. How can we explain that? Is that clear as a question? I mean, the fact that, yes, I could recite uh, uh, Shakespeare's Sonnet 18 without looking at it, and of course it's sublime, but it's the same function, basically. It is easier to memorize because it is in prosodic form. Where does that come from? I would propose for that answer to use a Greek distinction of temporality and that is the distinction between chronos and kairos. Chronos uh, is running time. Yeah, that's the basic concept of time. And chronos has no beginning nor ending. Yeah, this is just the time as it occurs, completely out of our reach. It's always there in the background. Uh, kairos is time that has a form, that has a beginning and has an ending. And in that sense, everything that has a rhythm has a form. So remember, when I was reading you Sonnet 18, and I will be reading you another poem in a short moment, we could metaphorically say the kairos of that rhythm, the kairos of that time, cuts into chronos. Is that clear, that metaphor? Yeah, I mean, the the temporality constituted by form doesn't make the chronos stop. The chronos go on, but it is a segment within chronos. Is that clear? Now, my thesis would be that in the first place, despite the sequentiality of my reading of Sonnet 18, everything within the kairos becomes simultaneous. It is not a sequence, really. It can be a sequence, but even in a ballad that is a narrative, there is a simultaneity between all parts. And so everything becomes 
contemporary. Everything is at the same time. There's no sequentiality between the beginning of the poem and the ending of the poem. And my impression is, this is speculation, and we should discuss it, to use another metaphor, that this simultaneity is contagious. That all of a sudden, in the moment of Kairos, everything that you have ever memorized becomes close. So the fact that when I'm saying when I'm using that kairos, that rhythm, uh, something that I learned uh, 59 years ago is as close as what we were talking about before the lecture today. And this is the memnotechnical function. Is that clear? So everything becomes simultaneous under the impact uh, of kairos under the impact of the form of rhythm and therefore even that which is very remote is as close as something I've heard, I've heard shortly before. But only under the condition that it has a form, that I can activate it as a form. Um, uh, this is something I want to illustrate by the next poem you find in your handout by a poem of uh, Gottfried Ben. Unfortunately, you don't find the name of that page. Ben is B-E-N-N. -E uh, and we have talked about him before the lecture, I think, Ben. You see it, asters? Does everybody have asters? Yeah. Um, I think Ben, together with Rilke, in my taste, and perhaps Paul Celan, is the greatest lyrical poet in German language of the 20th century. And that I'm reading you some poems in German is not uh, because I wouldn't have poems in English, but because I want to see whether, in a language that most of you don't know, it has an impact on you. That's the experiment that we are running. Now, Ben, uh, in this poem, Asters, talks about the Indian summer. It's a poem about the Indian summer and it is a poem that it is, is describing at the same time its own function. I mean, literary critics sometimes act as if it was the function of literature to continuously talk about the function of literature. That is, of course, absurd, but sometimes this happens, and this is one of those poems that is describing what it is doing. It is a poem about the Indian summer, and you will see in the first three stanzas by reciting the poem, you produce this impression of slowing down the passing of time, of slowing down chronos, of making things simultaneous. And then in the last stanza, he lets go. Is it clear what I'm describing? So you don't want this Indian summer to pass. You want this moment to stay. And interestingly, Ben is using the language of conjuring up a moment. You conjure up a moment. You make the moment present. But you make the moment present in a form that the moment does not pass by. And then as if he releases you from that function in the last stanza, he says, and now the summer is passing. So uh, we'll do this experiment together. I will read it to you in German. And you read it, I mean, you follow the semantics in English. Yeah? Let's see whether this functions. I mean, I've done it with these poems with a class of uh, undergraduates at Stanford where nobody knew German. And they ended up liking this poem very much because of its prosody. Okay, the assignment is clear. You read on the on the left side. I mean, or if you know German, you read on the right side. Astern. Astern, schwelende Tage, alte Beschwörung, Bann. Die Götter halten die Waage eine zögernde Stunde an. Noch einmal die goldenen Herden, der Himmel, das Licht, der Flor. Was brütet das alte Werden unter den sterbenden Flügeln vor? Noch einmal das Ersehnte, den Rausch, der Rosen du. Der Sommer stand und lehnte und sah den Schwalben zu. Noch einmal ein Vermuten, wo längst Gewissheit wacht. Die Schwalben streifen die Fluten und trinken Fahrt und Nacht. Und my point, I mean, I think, in the especially second third stanza and the first two verses of the fourth stanza, you have this holding on, I'm slowing down, this conjuring up the moment. And then the swallows are skimming the waters and drinking flight and dark 
It is letting go into a movement. Yeah? I mean, for me, this is the most beautiful illustration that I know uh, about this function of poetry to slow down time, uh, to create a temporality that has a form. Okay, second function of poetry. I mean, once again, this is not an exhaustive canon of function of poetry, but second function of poetry, uh, that would be this body coordination. Eh? I mean, we all know uh, that if you have a rhythm, you can dance together. I mean, I can't, but normal people can. If you have a rhythm, you can dance together. Or this is why there's military music. I mean, marching goes more easily uh, with a military band. This is one of the very few everyday examples, unfortunately, in being of time in Heidegger, that a band, uh, 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 soldiers march more efficiently uh, if they have music. Now, how can one explain that? Um, I will use once again this philosopher that I already mentioned, Niklas Luhmann. And Niklas Luhmann makes a distinction between two types of coupling, between what he calls systems, but humans can also be systems. Humans are systems between a biological system and a system of consciousness. Uh, there is one coupling between systems that he calls second order coupling. Think of a conversation, for example, that you have. So where um, state A in system one produces state B in system two, and state B in system two produces state three in system one, and so forth, and so forth. And it becomes more and more complex, like in a good conversation. And by becoming more and more complex, it ends up producing a self-observation. You think about yourself. You think about what you're doing. It produces a semantics of self-description. You start memorizing it, etc. It gets more and more complex. I mean, that's what we expect, for example, from a good relationship. I mean, a good personal relationship, a good intellectual relationship, that it be productive in that sense. Yeah? Uh, first order couplings are very much something that corresponds to my example of the logo of the Expo 2000. So um, state A in system 1 produces state B in system 2, state B in system 2 produces state 3 in system 1, and so forth, and so forth. But at a certain point, they return to state, to state 1, and so forth, and so forth, and they run through again. Now first order couplings, interestingly, do not produce more complexity. They always stay on the same level of complexity. I mean, anything that we call an engine is a first order coupling between different times. Imagine if engines became creative. That would become really, really bad. I mean, it is also interesting that at this point, uh, what we call artificial intelligence is still a first order coupling. And the fear is that artificial intelligence may turn into a second order coupling. Yeah? So. Uh, First order couplings are always on the same level. And we can say about humans uh, that first order couplings basically are accompanied by a low tension of attention, by a low tension of consciousness. This gradings of levels of consciousness are another concept by Husserl. Yeah? I mean, when you feel relaxed, you don't pay sharp attention, which is perfectly legitimate at some point. Uh, and I think this is what prosody does to you, uh, compared to other texts. I mean, I think the first reaction to a poem recited is not that you sharpen your attention. The first reaction is that you relax. You allow your body, when you listen to rhythm, to fall into that rhythm. You allow your consciousness to switch to a lower level, to drop, if you want to to a lower level of attention. And this is why you dance well. This is what I cannot achieve. Yeah? I mean, you have to allow your body to fall into a different rhythm. You have to allow your consciousness uh, to switch to a lower level of consciousness, to a lower level of tension, which I never allow myself, and which happens when you count while you try to dance. It will not work. I'm so bad, I admit, that I have even problems with walking stairs, yeah? which is a rhythmic thing. I mean. Don't worry, I will not fall down from the stair anytime soon. But 
But I have to pay attention. I mean, there's some stairs. I know two stairs in the entire world where I walk comfortably. But other stairs, I'm so bad with rhythm. I, I, this is why I'm obsessed with rhythm, of course, because I don't have it. But you get my point. I mean, this is the second function. Um, rhythm allows you that, metaphorically speaking, relaxation. Yeah? And also, in an anticipation to my final answer to the Roti question, I think if we assume that from an evolutionary point of view, we humans are very eccentric, uh, rhythm is a modality that allows us to become part of the material world, so to speak. Yeah? I mean, we are not eccentric. We are part of something that we normally have a difficulty of being part of. Is that second function clear? So prosody as rhythm, if you do it well, and if you're not as neurotic as I am, allows you to be part of something objective going on outside yourself. Now, what we still have is the most interesting function, the third function, and the function of conjuring up. Yeah, I mean, uh, creating this impression that something is present, physically present, that is really not physically present. And by trying to explain this, I will use the second function. The second function, the body coordination, based on the impression that the impact of rhythm lowers the tension of attention. Yeah? You relax. I mean, you are not at your sharpest, and that's OK. So I will presuppose that, and I use, for starters, a thought experiment by the American philosopher from the 1930s, George Herbert Mead. Yeah, so the thought experiment by George Herbert Mead goes as follows. Imagine an early Homo sapiens sapien, uh, not this aberration of uh, Neanderthals, which is a German aberration, but uh, an early Homo sapiens sapiens. And that early Homo sapiens sapiens, they were working very little, and people presuppose that in order to survive, they had to make an effort only four hours per day. So imagine this is a moment where he doesn't have to hunt or to, to kill some animals. Um, so he's sitting under a tree, and he perceives something. He perceives noises, or she perceives noises. And this perception at the state of relaxation, that's why I associate with the early Homo sapiens sapiens, is not transferred into a concept. What perceptions primarily do, and you can experiment that yourself, they produce images in your mind. Yeah, images in the very sense of images, of imagination, of the primary sense of imagination, images that are not filtered by concepts. This is what I would associate with the impact of prosody, relaxation, low tension of consciousness. And precisely because you do not filter you do not compatibilize your images with concepts, with abstract concepts. Concepts uh, They remain in the status of images. And now imagine this early Homo sapiens sapiens has two different images. I mean, either he hears a noise that conjures up, that evokes the image of another animal that is much stronger than her or him, uh, and that sounds hungry. Or uh, it evokes the image of an animal that is much weaker. What this does with the early Homo sapiens sapiens, who, who does not filter the images uh, with concepts, it leads to direct innovation. It triggers movement of aggression if the other animal is weaker, or of escape if the other animal is stronger immediately. Is that clear? So I associate with the function of prosody that we can switch off, so to speak, this filtering function of concepts, which normally produces a hiatus between the image and the direct reaction. If we don't filter with concepts, the images lead to innovation immediately, to body reaction immediately. And this is why. I think any sophisticated theory of imagination talks metaphorically, metonymically, to proximity with the body. Yeah, when we say imagination, we think this is something closer to bodily reactions than other operations of the mind. I mean, to quote just one 
philosopher, psychoanalyst who obsessed, obsessed with his idea. It's Lacan in the, in the eighth seminar. I mean, the first 200 pages of the eighth seminar go precisely about this proximity of the body. Is that clear? To give you another example from the world of psychoanalytics, that is daydreams. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we call daydreams are actually imaginations unfiltered by concept. Uh, we let go, and when we hear daydreams and think of Freud, we think of erotic imagination. And you all know, I know an American professor is not supposed to talk so graphically, uh, that erotic imaginations can have a visible body impact, both with women and with men in different ways. Uh, but they can. I mean, is that clear? So you could say, uh, that imagination, unfiltered by concepts, and unfiltered by concepts under the impression of prosody, imaginations produces body reactions that are absolutely equivalent to the reaction that you would have if what is thematized in a poem would be physically present to you. Is that clear? It is not present. And when we say conjuring up, we know it doesn't really conjure up the bridge of Heidelberg, for example. Or imagine a poem about Baroda, a neighborhood in Baroda. We know it's not really there. But it is also not completely unreal to say it conjures it up, because our body reacts as if we were in real present of this object. Is that, is, is that clear? I think. Hence, for example, the normally amateurish desire of people um, to use prosody to conjure up beloved and cherished moments in their life, erotic moments, moments of closeness, moments of dignity, and so forth, and so forth. They normally don't manage to do that. But this idea that you react physically to something you imagine in a way as if the object was there is something that we associate with prosody. It's I mean, strangely, I have the impression that you all followed much better with the third most complex uh, uh, theoretical reflection on with the first one. Now, what I would like to do, I mean, continuing the experiment that we began with the poems by Gottfried Benn, I would like to read you in concluding, yeah, and boy, is it time to conclude. I would like to read you in concluding two of my favorite poems by Friedrich Hölderlin, poet from, I mean, who lived for 74 years, 37, exactly half of his life in a state of psychosis. We don't quite know. Uh, the first one is a very short one, Half of Life that evokes in the two stanzas two completely different non-specific worlds. A beautiful natural world of warmth of summer and a very cold world. And I call it half of life and the title is not quite clear. I mean one of my actually eminent colleagues of German studies in Germany without being embarrassed was interpreting it as, as a poem about midlife crisis. I mean, how absurd that is, you will realize when you read the poem for a moment. It's definitely not about midlife crisis. It's about the contrast. It's two very different existential situations. The experiment is, so I will read it to you again in German, you follow in English, whether it has this impact on you. Um, so do you have half of life, Hälfte des Lebens? Hälfte des Lebens. Mit gelben Birnen hänget und voll mit wilden Rosen das Land in den See. Ihr holden Schwäne und trunken von Küssen tunkt ihr das Haupt ins heilig nüchterne Wasser. Weh mir, wo nehme ich, wenn es Winter ist, die Blumen und wo den Sonnenschein und Schatten der Erde. Die Mauern stehen Sprachlos und kalt, im Winde klirren die Fahnen. 
I mean, if you forgive me, as this is so short and I so love to recite it, I recite it once again. The question is whether you get the Stimmung, as you say in German, the climate, the mood. I mean, whether this evokes something. Of course, this is not a specific landscape. This is not the question. But Hälfte des Lebens. Mit gelben Birnen hänget und voll mit wilden Rosen das Land in den See. Ihr holden Schwäne und trunken von Küssen tunkt ihr das Haupt ins heilig nüchterne Wasser. Weh mir. Wo nehme ich, wenn es Winter ist, die Blumen und wo den Sonnenschein und Schatten der Erde? Die Mauern stehen, sprachlos und kalt, im Winde klirren die Fahnen. Uh, the other and uh, final poem I want to read for you, and this was all my fault, uh, begins on the page before Hälfte des Lebens and then continues on the page after Hälfte des Lebens. And it is a poem about the city of Heidelberg. Um, and interestingly enough, like Ben does in the poem about Asters, uh, Hölderlin is using the vocabulary of conjuring up. Yeah, I mean, uh, Ben says actually conjuring up in an old-fashioned way in the first stanza. He wants to conjure up the Indian summer to make it stop. And uh, Hölderlin, as you will see in the third stanza, says that whenever he sees that bridge in Heidelberg, which actually if you go there, you can completely get this landscape. This is a very specific landscape. You can put yourself in the place from which this poem is imagined. Yeah? Um, that Hölderlin also says, whenever I am in this place, the place paralyzes me. The memory of the place paralyzes me. It glues me, he says. It glues me to the place, yeah, this physical proximity. And I think this is what the poem uh, produces. This one I will only read once. Heidelberg. Lange lieb ich dich schon, möchte dich mir zur Lust Mutter nennen und dir schenken ein kunstlos Lied, Du der Vaterlandstätte ländlich schönste, so viel ich sah. Wie der Vogel des Walds über die Gipfel fliegt, schwingt sich über den Strom, wo er vorbei dir glänzt, leicht und kräftig die Brücke, die von Wagen und Menschen tönt. Wie von Göttern gesandt, fesselt ein Zauber einst auf die Brücke mich an, da ich vorüberging und herein in die Berge mir die reizende Ferne schien. Und der Jüngling, der Strom fort in die Ebene zog, traurig froh wie das Herz, wenn es sich selbst zu schön, liebend unterzugehen, in die Fluten der Zeit sich wirft. Quellen hattest du ihm, hat es dem flüchtigen kühle Schatten geschenkt, und die Gestade sahen all ihm nach, und es bebte aus den Wellen ihr lieblich Bild. Aber schwer in das Tal hing die gigantische, schicksalskundige Burg nieder bis auf den Grund, von den Wassern zerrissen, doch die ewige Sonne goss, oh no, das, doch die ewige Sonne goss ihr verjüngendes Licht über, die alten, über das alternde Riesenbild und umher grünte lebendiger Efeu. Freundliche Wälder rauschten über die Burg herab, Sträuche blühten herab, bis wo im heiteren Tal an den Hügel gelehnt oder dem Ufer hold deine fröhlichen Gassen unter duftenden Gärten ruhen. I mean, if you have ever been there, and one of you has been there, but even if you have not been there, that would be the function of prosody. Yeah? It evokes an image of something as if that something was there. It doesn't depend on the objectivity. It's different, of course, if you have seen it. Uh, if I would ever do PowerPoint, which I never do, because I think it kills imagination, actually. And I think an academic lecture should awaken imagination. Yeah? I could project you an image, but this wouldn't help. This is not about you getting the correct image of the bridge of Heidelberg. It is you having the impression that you are in presence of that bridge. And just as a footnote, it's very funny, because today this is the old bridge of Heidelberg, but for Hölderlin it was high-tech. 
because it was a new type of bridge for the first time constructed in Germany. So it also had this connotation of being 18th century high tech. And as Hölderlin was very, quote unquote, progressive, he became later on a, a German Jacobin. So affirming the French Revolution, he also thought it was pathetic to have such a modern bridge. But now, um, if you are concerned that this goes on and on and on, this is actually almost, for the lack of two or three sentences, the end of the lecture. And I thank you for bearing with me. Uh, I think for some of you it was too much or not interesting. But I have the community that uh, you were concentrated. And I actually had the impression that until I didn't make the right page change, I mean, until the last two stanzas, I've never recited Heidelberg so well. So I wanted to thank you for that. No, it depends a lot. I mean, you know that from teaching. It depends a lot on, on the attention. Um, but what would it mean, what would the answer to the question of Roti be? Roti had the impression a few days before he died, he would have had a fuller life, full is important, a fuller life, not had he read more poetry, but had he been able to memorize more poetry. Yeah? What, what could that mean? I mean, I'd say, and I hope we discuss that, that the point of convergence of my three hypotheses would be a fuller life would be a more metabolic life. I mean, not in the sense of uh, physical metabolism, but a more metabolic life, like a life more reinserted into the objective materiality but by which we are surrounded. You're memorizing poetry and having a broader register of knowing poetry that you can activate would mean that we are more inserted, more part, less eccentric as humans um, in the life by which we are surrounded. This is not an ecological motif, has nothing to do with ecology, but it has a certain convergence with ecology. This is not about preservation of the planet or something like that. Uh, but it is perhaps about recuperating a dimension of human existence which in the age of artificial intelligence, and I come from Silicon Valley, we run the risk of definitively losing. And I thank you for your attention.
because the rigidity, the stiffness of the body when one uh, is expected to be uh, nationalistic or, and you did mention military marches, which is not really a very relaxed body or a, very, uh, a body at ease. It is actually a body at, uh, uh, it's, it's a very erect body. I'm not. Uh, no, 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 no. So, would your thesis, would your hypothesis hold for uh, poetry which is related to the nation? I mean, this is a fabulous question because it comes, as we say in American English, with a baseball metaphor. It comes from left field. I mean, completely unexpected and, and really good at the same time. I mean, it's horrible to say good question, it's condescending, but I mean, I was really, I was excited when you were asking this question. So let me start by not by a disclaimer, uh, but by saying that the three functions, I don't have a claim that the three functions have to fit. They are not making up a, a system or something like that, right? I mean, I'm just having tried to elaborate three functions that we kind of know of poetry. Everybody knows it has a technical function. Everybody knows it kind of coordinates bodies. And everybody, when you say it conjures up things that hardly anybody has ever read a poem would not agree with. And I tried to elaborate them. And uh, so I don't necessarily, I mean, when you're saying the second one doesn't fit, I find that interesting. And I would rather prefer it to fit, but I'm saying, no, I didn't claim it. It, it had to fit. But no, to interrupt, because if my body is at ease, particularly yeah, yeah, yeah. in the atmosphere that we live in today in India, I would land up in a very stiff environment, namely the prison. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay, you respond and then I, then I respond. Yeah. Um, my take would be like this, that uh, I'm playing the devil's advocate, I don't agree with, uh, <coughs> but uh, when the national anthem is played, uh, okay, in a way it relaxes the system in such a way that it does not allow the person to think. Uh, yeah. Uh, and there is a stasis of reason, you get carried away by the national anthem, if, as many people do. And maybe it, in that sense, it could be a relaxation of the rational instinct. I don't know whether it... Oh, no, it's sort of I the second <laughs> That's fantastic. Look, I mean, there's one better thing. I mean, everybody uh, wants to participate. I, I, uh, I like the second part. Like, you said it doesn't fit. Yes, uh, uh, the way no, you interpret it. Even if it doesn't fit, that you would be. Even if it does that. But like, I am from the army, so I can you know, very well imagine that situation when we used to have our overdose of marching and everything. Your body is in a, such a terrible state that you cannot take it anymore. But that was the time when the band, the military rhythms, those uh, specifically the few catchy ones, that used to help. You know, that used to uh, you know, help you overcome that uh, stress or uh, what should I say, I mean it used to make it easy, it used to make it easy and it, you know, you could carry on with that. So uh, what you say, what she also said is there, nationalism, I mean that is, we are going a little different there, that is to subdue your brain into a sort of a submission, if you were sort of, a, you know, a impose a structure on you. But in this case, it is a little different, you know. It, again, it is imposing a structure on you, but then it is also, you know, you're identifying with that rhythm. You're getting carried away with that rhythm. So possibly that is what they may mean when, you know, they say that it is a relaxation or it makes it easy. So, I think maybe. it's a matter of politics of location also, and where you are situated, mm -hmm. the context, I think. Yeah, however, I would like to, if, if particularly focusing on the national anthem. That I'm still working on the <laughs> <laughs> Can you, can you come to compare it to sleepwalking? 
Yeah. Can you compare it to sleepwalking? Because you have to wait, be I'm a sleepwalker asleep. that I've waited with. And you have to be awake as well. So <laughs> both things. And you have to be imagining as well. I mean, actually, my, my wife tells me that when I'm sleepwalking, <laughs> nobody enters a bathtub and do rowing. <laughs> it's a very rhythmic kind of, kind of thing, <laughs> which I'm not capable of doing when I'm awake. So. Anyway, um, so first remark. Um, I mean, the Western, let's be cautious about it, and if it exists in India, maybe a Western projection, a colonial projection. Uh, association uh, between literature and nationality, and then more specifically between literature and prosody, I mean between nationality and prosody, is not only romantic, but I mean, my thesis was actually that um, the world constitutive form, yeah, why we associate, I mean, why the meta classic of all of Europe, Western literature, Shakespeare, there is no such classic in any national literature. But I mean, Shakespeare nevertheless is English, and Corneille and Racine Molière are French, and Camões Vieira are Portuguese, and uh, Thelma. You get my point. I mean, they are transcendental classics of Western culture, but they are also deeply rooted uh, in a pre nationalistic national feeling. Yeah, uh, this is one of the many failures of the European Union, which I think this was a full-heartedly good project, but it completely did not go well, that there is no European canon. Sadly, but there is no European canon. There is no Western canon. You can't teach at American University great works. And nevertheless, I mean, sadly, I would say, just to emphasize what you were saying, these are national classics. You may want it or not, but Cervantes is a national classic, proof being, uh, that practically all European nations are wealthy enough to run their national cultural institutes. And they haven't produced an agreement, but they all have the name of the most canonized national poet. Goethe Institute, Camões Institute, Cervantes Institute, and so forth and so forth. And my point, I mean, they are already before that moment uh, uh, profoundly national and become then national in the romantic sense of proto-nationalistic in the 19th. I'm just mentioning that because, I mean, that would be a worthwhile book development of this reflection I started with about what do you mean in Western culture when you say literature? I mean, I would even strengthen more now the connotation not so much of nationalistic, but of national. Yeah? I mean, which today, this is why I was mentioning the EU is a problem. It's very difficult ultimately to transcend that. It's very difficult to think Cervantes outside space can, Shakespeare perhaps, but, but it's very, very difficult. I, mean, I love Racine when I'm in Paris, you can watch Racine, the Comédie Française, I would never watch Racine in German. I know it's bad taste, but even in French, I have to be in Paris or Marseille or wherever. Okay, then second, um, Contagion the National Anthem Syndrome that, that everybody was so interested in. I mean, the pro, the bonus, the positive part of the national anthem, for me, I mean, I have a close relationship to the national anthem because uh, I'm citizen not of the country where I was born, uh, but I'm citizen of a country that I decided to be a citizen of. And this is by far not a country without any problems. But I have to say, I love to be an American citizen. And I mean, you know, even in Trump times, I'm proud to be an American citizen. So I love to hear Stars and Stripes, which are played over and again, especially for a sports fan. There's no sports event, not a high school football game, where they don't play the national anthem. And there I stand, uh, uh, listening to the national anthem, and often, not as often as with Solid 18, but I do get goose flash from time to time. Um, and I think it is a good moment in the sense of my final hypothesis um, that it makes you in a metabolic way part of a community. Yeah? I mean, for the people who stand there and to either stand there and look at the, uh, at the Stars and Stripes or sing along, many Americans sing along actually, or don't, Germans never sing along, it's very funny. Uh, you know why Spaniards never sing along? You ever seen Spaniards never sing along the national anthem? 
because they kept the national anthem from Franco fascism. And the text of the national anthem is completely fascist. There's a compromise <coughs> in the New Spain is that we keep the, the, the music of the national anthem, but without, and so the Spanish national, national anthem today officially has no verses, has no text. Anyway, um, but it comes at a price. That's what I wanted to say. And it comes at the, of the, at the price as lowering your attention of consciousness. Yeah, I mean, I have this good feeling of being a metabolic part of the other American citizens in the stadium. Uh, I become what one can call in the Christian tradition, I think this is an interesting concept, part of a mystical body. I don't know whether I, you are not supposed to, I'm supposed not obliged to know, but the first self-description of Christianity is Corpus Christi Mysticum, Christ's mystical body. And that means in pre-reformatory theology that it is a type of community that does not exclude the body. Yeah? Today when we talk of communities, we talk about solidarity, we talk about consensus, we talk about shared interest that always excludes the body. Whereas theologically, the mystical body includes the body. So, I'm in the stadium, I listen to the national anthem, I have good flesh or not, and it's a good moment, and I think it's a moment that, that one should cultivate, but it comes at a price of lowering of consciousness. I'm not sharp when I'm listening to that. And when I'm listening to that, I would agree on things as stupid as el pueblo, unido, jamás será vencido. Yeah? I mean, that's the risk of it. And this is why, and this is of course the horror example that you use, uh, the Nazi party writers at Nuremberg were full of equivalents of the national anthems. I mean, the national anthem during uh, Nazism in Germany was the so-called Horst Wessenli. And this was a song about a Berlin pimp that was a member of the Nazi party that the communists had shot, and that was the emblematic, uh, emblematic victim. And if you see the Nuremberg party rallies, you always have this music in the background. And then people, yes, I mean, I know that from my father who was born in 1920, uh, 80 kilometers away from Nuremberg, of course, as a Hitler, you know, he went there. And this was a pathetic moment. This was a pathetic moment that he didn't want to fondly remember, but somehow, and I'm deliberately talking about an ambiguity, he fondly remembered, and that's a problem. So I will say that this, so what, what I want to elaborate is not just the usual critique of this moment. Of course, yes, in the name of rationality, you can say how bad that is, but I would say, as far as I'm concerned, national anthems are not completely banal. I would not abandon them. I would wish to have a solution how you could be intellectually sharp, so not at this low point of consciousness and still listen to the national anthem. And that brings me to a third commentary, and this is, I mean, as you realize, not pre-prepared, I mean, this was triggered by your fabulous question, um, you know, about poetry on a very high level. Uh, I think, at least for me practically, it has a point of observation. So when I try, and I do that more and more when I'm teaching or giving lectures to recite this Hölderlin poem, you've realized that especially the one in Heidelberg is prosodically very complex. So if I feel that I was good in realizing the poem, I mean reading the prosody of the which I thought I was very good today doing it for, for Heidelberg. Uh, I have to say, I hardly get any semantics. Yeah, I mean, I know the semantics of the poem, but I don't get anything. And if I concentrate on semantics in Hölderlin, mean, which can be amazingly complex, I mean, not so much in Heidelberg, but in others, I mean, it comes with mythology, landscape descriptions. When I concentrate on that side, and sometimes when you do that in public or in lecture, you cannot help concentrating on it then I will goof up on the, on the prosody. So I think on the, the highest poetic level, you have this double challenge and this double possibility, and there is no good solution. You have to somehow to have to balance these things. I mean, and I don't like balance in the sense of a half prosody, half, it is a constant challenge. Yeah? I mean, sometimes you're more on the content side, sometimes you're more on the prosody side. Um, 
it would of course be an interesting thought experiment what would happen uh, if one had a national anthem with a high, I mean a content-wise high level poetry. Actually that existed uh, and that was the, uh, the, the national anthem of the no longer existing German Democratic Republic. Uh, that had actually a national anthem written by a remarkable poet, um, uh, Wilhelm Becher, I mean, not one of the greatest, but a very, very good poet. And funnily, nobody ever sang it. I mean, they wanted me to sing it, but, but it was not successful. But you get my point. I mean, this is, this is precisely... Yet Stegel would also explain why normally the lyrics of national anthems are comparatively... Um, Yes, yeah. 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 There's also another tendency of just saying that for, for how long, how many stanzas does the Indian national anthem have? The original poem was five stanzas. Five. So the national anthem is only the first stanza. Ah, I see, this confirms my. I have a theory, but it's, it's a joke, but I think the theory really holds that the larger a country is demographically, the less stanzas has the national anthem. <laughs> <laughs> Proof being that the longest national anthem that I know is Uruguay. I mean, Uruguay is 2.3 million people, and the Uruguayan national anthem officially has 37 stanzas. <laughs> so I was very happy to hear that the Indian national anthem is short. OK. Mm -hmm. You. And, do yeah. and I, as I don't have to work today anymore, <laughs> can do an endless discussion. Uh, I think uh, in the binaries that you have set up, uh, I have this, uh, I wish to, uh, I have a problem with that, um, that essentially uh, uh, all literature, good literature, uh, conjures up and it largely depends on imagination, metaphors, whatever. And uh, poetry is a kind of assimilation of binaries. The paradox is resolved because all great poetry is paradoxical. And therefore, uh, and we should also not forget the fact that uh, poet, literature and poetry exists in language, which is essentially cerebral or intellectual. And it passes through the gut of language. So uh, it is only in poetry, perhaps, that these two polarities are resolved uh, or they merge. Just as we now, science is exploring this phenomena of gut feeling, where uh, the brain is also situated within the stomach. So I would reverse it and say that. Uh, the biological is also is the biological also in language and in the cerebral and in the intellectual. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah. I so that's one way of resolving the problem instead of uh, uh, creating this binary between pragmatism and romanticism. Uh, and it's not true, prosody only that conjuration takes place. I would put it. I and uh, also the fact that uh, prosody is semantics based and you cannot take away the semantics from prosody. For instance, the trochaic meter uh, is used essentially for martial poems or martial music. So the meaning is very much in the prosody rather than out of it. So I have this quarrel with your statement that uh, emotionally it relaxes uh, or it appeals to the lesser consciousness or the lesser brain over there. That I haven't said about the lesser brain. No, but I'm, I'm interested <laughs> in that sense. Yeah. Yes. I mean, uh, just, just two commentaries, two immediate reactions, and I try to, to answer more systematically. Um, uh, with this reflection at the beginning about romanticism and so forth and so forth, this was not about distinctions. This was just trying to add up connotations uh, that cultivated Westerners have when they say literature. 
as I was saying, that they could not reconstruct, but the reason that they understand each other. I mean, there are many such words. We use a word like literature, normally it's not a problem. I mean, it's a problem only for literary critics to define what it is. But people use it and understand each other. And I, I asked my, my thesis was they understand each other because the connotations that I was mentioning are shared connotations. Do they have to be systematic? Not at all. They can be shared connotations, can be contradictory between themselves. So I was neither making a sharp distinction between Romanticism and later stages, nor saying they all converge. Yeah? This is just an, I mean, it's just an addition if you want to. Um, then secondly, your question about different prosodic forms being related to different meanings. Um, I will not back to differ, but I will back to defer. Uh, because, I mean, Hölderlin actually, uh, in a fantastically interesting uh, poetological, I mean, reflective um, uh, fragment about the change of tonality, tonality is interesting, in poetry <coughs> has this association. Is there a prosodic form in ancient Greek language that is specifically appropriate for tragedy? Etc. Etc. Uh, I would actually say, and I mean it. So this is not like like saying I disagree with you. It's not completely clear to me. It is not completely clear to me uh, whether prosodic forms have. I mean, statistically, maybe yes, an affinity to contents or not. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, this is a question that I've been tackling for ten years now. Uh, you know, a scandal of my own research and thinking. I cannot say that I've made, I, mean, I could talk now endlessly about it. I have not made much progress. It's a fantastically interesting question. I would disagree with you in the sense that you seem to be certain that there is a connection. And when I'm saying I'm not certain that there is a connection, I'm not saying it in the sense I'm certain there's none. I just don't know. I mean, I find it a fascinating question. It's not question. a question of knowledge, I would put it like this, but if you examine uh, Milton's Paradise Lost, for instance, uh, why did he choose to write an unrhymed pentameter? And, and why did the neoclassicists use uh, rhyming words? One, because it lends itself beautifully to satire. So the, the prosodic rhythms do contribute to the meaning of or Shakespeare's, most of Shakespeare's sonnets, for example, are iambic pentameters. Why? I mean, so, okay, maybe I give you my reaction to what you're saying, and then we agree to disagree, um, if you want to. <laughs> no, which I think, I mean, just, 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 just uh, as a commentary for the younger people, I think moments of agreeing to disagree are the really intellectually productive moments. Absolutely. I mean, those of consensus are pushy pushy shoo shoo as we say in California. I mean, no, to, to have clarity on what you disagree always brings you in the direction of thinking. I mean, see, I think the language that they're using, why did they choose to? I mean, little do we know whether they ever chose. Uh, I mean, was there a moment when uh, Shakespeare chose to create well, I'm Shakespeare? I'm not saying that it was a conscious choice on their part. Maybe because they were great poets, it came naturally to them. But uh, critics have argued that uh, it is, it would not, uh, Paradise Lost would not lend itself to the grand theme of the Bible had it been written in rhyming words. Yeah. I mean, it would have been a ridiculous attempt. But maybe, you know, if you had chosen in your sense to use rhymes, then people would say uh, it would not lend itself to non-rhyme. You get my point. I mean, once they, and I'm not, I'm not saying it's banal, but once there is such a word, I mean, like Sonnet 18, it is so evidently good, it is so epiphanically good, that it kills the imagination of an alternative. I mean, I cannot think of Heidelberg in a different way from Hölderlin. But, I mean, and I'm, I'm not wanting to push that to the absurd. I mean, I think this is a fabulous, I mean, this is a necessary question to pursue, but I haven't even started with the more systematic question. Systematic answers, I mean, um, a, I completely agree with you, conjuring up is not the privilege of prosodic uh, a form or prosodic forms of literature. It is clearly very strongly there 
in frozen literature. Yeah, I mean, whether it's frozen or abso absolutely. Or I would say, yeah. however, um, and this is why people associate uh, conjuring up more with poetry than with prose texts. Um, <coughs> I do think one can explain that's what I was trying to do and why it oftentimes prosodic form intensifies the contrary function. Yeah. I mean, it's a little bit like you can also memorize things without rhymes, but it helps. So I think it, I mean, pragmatically speaking, practically speaking, uh, it oftentimes intensifies the contrary function, but we completely agree. It is not in the sense of a bad binary, only uh, on that side. And secondly, no, I, I definitely don't forget that all these things are constituted in language. But my answer to the Roti question that Roti didn't think about, uh, why would he have had a fuller life had he remembered more poetry, uh, would be that, and I will tell you one word about Richard Roti then, I mean, as I happen to be his neighbor, uh, it would have been a more metabolic, I mean, not in the, in the biological or dietary sense, metabolic life, a life more integrated into its material realities. Mm -hmm. I mean, rhodium, uh, if I may say, love to pieces. I mean, which I learned a lot from him, he was such a good neighbor. <coughs> I mean, Roti was one of those persons who the French would describe as, il ne se sentait pas bien dans sa peau. He didn't feel well within his skin. I mean, or in, in colloquial American English, was extremely goofy. Yeah, I mean, somebody would not only not be able to dance, I suppose, but, but you know, those people always seem to make the wrong movement in the wrong, I mean, he was a fabulous teacher, but um, he was so goofy that when students who were kind of taken away from, from his lectures, Chelsea Clinton, this wanted to do pre-medical pre, I mean, pre college and then study medicine, the fact that she then did history, did a PhD in history because she got in her freshman year into Richard Rhodes' class and was blown away. And then I said to her, I said, oh, why don't you talk to him in, in Richard Rhodes' office hours? And he goes to the officer and said, oh, Professor Humbert, I think Professor Rhodes was mad at me. And I said, no, he was not mad at you, he's just goofy. So, he, I mean, you get my point. So, for somebody like that, the intuition that he would have a fuller life memorizing more poetry. I mean, he didn't think about that, but goes fully in this direction. Of course poetry is language. And because it is language, it is something that's very close to Roti. But the paradox would somehow be that while it is language and through language, it helps you to have a more metabolic relationship. <coughs> And if you can agree that, I would thank you because that's a much better, no, no, that's a much more complex description of what I wanted to say. Of course it's through language. Yeah, and, and I definitely don't forget that. But paradoxically, through language, it helps you to have, and, and I think the Roti example is a good one in a way that I also had foreseen precisely for him it was so important because he was somebody who didn't feel bad within his uh, skin. And the last answer would be the most sophisticated one, but I cannot read my own hand. Right so we have to postpone that. We'll go to the next question. Okay. Yeah. When you talk about conjuring up a world, would it also entail the disruption of the world as we know it, as a function of literature? Because you know, even in creating dystopias and conjuring up would mean giving uh, or juxtaposing several possibilities. But, uh, you know, dystopias, which are in fact allegories of the world that we live in, you know, that there we see an ending of all possibilities. And maybe you can read even Dante's Inferno as that kind of a dystopic text. So. That I think I have, I mean, uh, for, for starters, I have uh, a kind of well circumscribed answer, not a standard answer to that. I mean, one answer is actually that I have long thought uh, what would be my last seminar on uh, Stanford campus, which will be in this coming winter trimester. And the title is Literature and Bliss. Mm. 
and by bliss I mean something like ecstatic states, yeah, including utopias and so forth and so forth. So, meaning when I talk about conjuring up and about producing the impression of being in physical proximity to a world, which is not really there, uh, that of course includes worlds that never ha have never empirically existed. That includes worlds that may be utopian, that includes worlds that may be dystopian, that includes worlds, what I would like to say, as a potential function of literature, uh, that reminds you of a potential of the world, how good it can be. I just I want to say that the conjuring up function is not bound to the real empirical existence of the world that's conjured up. That was no, not no, the no, question. That is not really my question. You know, it's not a world that doesn't really exist. That is a world which is un defamiliarized, but yet too familiar. I'm not, I can't yeah, give yeah, you yeah. an example from poetry, but look at a work in 1984, you know, which is dystopic, but it is too familiar because you have actually lived it that way. So it is not a world that doesn't exist, that is defamiliarized, yet very intensely familiar to you. Yeah, then, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, the answer is in the first place, uh, of course, yet, and I, yes, and I, I can well, I mean, can relatively well remember my first reading of, of 1984, and I can also remember I'm that old. And we're all living towards 1984, you know, there's still so, so many days left to 1984, and so forth, and so forth. I mean, once again, um, yes, this conjured up a world that, as you we were saying, and I agree with you, we had been living without knowing that we were living that world. Yes. Uh, I would say this effect that the Russian formalists were so interested in, of defamiliarization, yeah, that is an effect that I would not dissociate from prosody, but I would also not immediately associate you get my point? I mean, the techniques which create defamiliarization are techniques that, I mean, that I would not associate with, uh, with not process. Not defamiliarization in the Russian formalistic sense. What about Brett's idea of defamiliarization? Because it is by yeah, yeah, making yeah, yeah. it intensely familiar that it defamiliarizes. No, look, I mean, the point I'm making is that let's talk a poem now. I mean, not... Mm. not Let's actually take a poem by Brecht, who is one of the many authors who I think is obsessed with that. He was famous for theater, but I think he was much better as a poet. I mean, Brecht's poetic over is relatively small, but of very high quality. Um, so, the defamiliarization that Brecht produces. Um, and I will give you an example. Uh, I think is independent from the conjuring up function. So he conjures up something uh, and then defamiliarizes. The example is a very, very short poem. I don't know, does any of you know what June 17th, 1953 was in Germany? Clearly not. I mean, June 17th, 1953 was a kind of proletarian revolution against the East German communist government. Of course, in East Germany, it was interpreted as being a subversion from Western Germany. In Western Germany, it was celebrated uh, as the true proletariat going against communism. For me, it was great because my birthday is June 15th, and June 17th became a holiday in Germany, so I always had the sequence of holidays after my birthday. And Brecht, who was the, the darling poet of the Eastern German government, but at the same time critical, very shortly uh, after this event, uh, wrote a text on in prosodic form that I almost remember as a very brief text. Uh, nach dem 17. Juni 1953 veröffentlicht das Zentralkomitee der Kommunistischen Partei Deutschlands ein, ein Beschluss, in dem es heißt, das Volk könne nur durch gesteigerte Arbeitskraft das Vertrauen der Regierung wiedergewinnen. Wäre es da nicht besser, 
Die Regierung würde das Volk abschaffen und ein neues Volk wählen. That's the point. The translation is more or less, I cannot produce a precise translation. After June 17, 1953, uh, there was an official statement by the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Eastern Germany, Democratic Germany, um, stating that only through um, intensified efforts in labor, uh, the people could recuperate the trust of the government that it had now lost. That's the quote. Would it then not be better uh, that the government dissolved the people and elected a new one? You get the point, you get the irony. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful formulation. And the Verfremdungs effect, in that sense, not in the Russian sense, is of course, that you quote what is constitutive for democracy, namely that the sovereign, the people, uh, elects the government, and if it's not happy with the government, dissolves the government, that you turn that around and say, would the government not dissolve the people and elect a different one? Yeah? So this is a fabulous formula. It's, it's, it's great. I'm happy that you liked it even in my memory and translation. Uh, where I think the conjuring up effect that has two immediacy effects, that has two components. One component is the prosody. You realize that it sounds different in my, in my translation than in the quote. Uh, and the other one, which is, an, uh, I mean, um, a conjuring up effect that has nothing to do with prosody, is the quote. Uh, it quotes the text by the Central Committee in quotes. And by quoting the text of the Central Committee, it also becomes much more aggressive. You know, when the Central Committee, I mean, as Brecht is not saying, dares to say, has the balls or the ovaries to say, um, <laughs> people can only recuperate the trust that it has lost by reduplicated laborious efforts. I mean, that is so scandalous that you only in a poem you can see. You get my point? Mm -hmm. So I want to make an example how uh, the prosodic form and the conjuring up function of the quote intensifies the, defamil the defamiliarization effect of that poem without the defamiliarization effect being directly related to prosody. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, I'm not saying that anybody of the two of us is wrong, but like in your case, in your case, this fabulous question helped me to think in a more complex way about it. I mean, discussion with you makes me hopeful that maybe one day I may find a solution about content and prosodic form. If I may add to Vinny's uh, no, observation no. about yeah. familiarization and defamiliarization, I think uh, this happened uh, as early as in the 18th century when Wordsworth and Coleridge both brought up their joint manifesto, mm -hmm. where they explicitly mentioned that their attempt is to familiarize the defamiliar and defamiliarize and making vice versa. Yes. So Kubla Khan is an is a is an ideal example of the of the same. I think and and they also put a lot of emphasis on prosody and, and rhythm particularly. So there was a certain beat to their poems because it was the early publication. It was only later on that the sophistication I mean, whether, as we have a latent discussion about binary streaming, <laughs> I would say it's the same. I mean, you can, of course, say it's the same, then it produces a paradox, right? I mean, if you have, can have two contradictory predications on something you call the same, or you can distinguish them and can see that's two sides, it's two the aspects. paradox which results, if, if the most ideal example is done and is conceits, mm. where the sacred and the profane the cerebral and the physical, they all come together effortlessly. And, and, and the resolution is through the paradox. It doesn't hold the two things separate at all. So. Yeah, we have, I, I, I think we have different tendencies there. I, and for me, I mean, but that's, that's the question of individual intellectual yes. style. I always like to stop short of saying it comes together, right? I mean, like when I say prosody and content never quite come together, it would be so beautiful. But, but this is just to, I mean, I get what you are saying, 
and it enriches my, my thinking about it and I have no reason on earth to reject it or something like that. It's more like, but keep on enriching it. You will. Um, just be quick. Actually, I had a question. No, don't. One of the I haven't um, earned my dinner yet. Yeah. Um, I had a question on the philosophy of nothingness. Um, recently, I read this book, uh, Why the World Does Not Exist by Marco Gabriels, where he uh, argues that the microphone exists, the the water bottle the exists. Yeah. The, the and the, yeah, the table exists, but the world as the world in form does not exist uh, for us. Even Peter Slaughter did also talks about uh, the forms that we have been talking about and imagination and infinity within the field of philosophy through uh, his books on spirology of bubbles and forms. So uh, my question was that how is it possible uh, through prosody or through text or through stage or through words to think about nothingness that the void that is created like we our bodies are existing in the space because they have filled up the void and that's outside the body there exists a void which creates uh, the space so how is it possible to think of something that does not exist in a language. For example, the book uh, uh, Why the World Does Not Exist, the, the front cover comes with a photograph of a unicorn. A unicorn is something like a horse. But he says that the unicorn exists, Gabriel. Yeah, and the horn and the, uh, the, horn, uh, and the feathers of the bird and so on. Something that we know. And when we talk of nothingness or void, how do we place it? Because even Heidegger talks about that uh, text is uh, it's very impossible to mention my ideas and this, uh, language in this language. Therefore, I do poetry, which also is worked on the basis of that poetic of mathematics, philosophy of mathematics, where he applies this logic of like one, two, three, and uh, creating stanza, uh, which only relates to certain a uh, personal level. For example, if I write a poetry, it may only have certain yeah. meaning for myself. It does not be the way. Okay, so. Um, I want to preface uh, my answer. Um, as I was saying at the beginning, this is really true, and I hope you got somehow the impression that by my own enthusiasm about speaking to you and with you. Uh, and like this morning, I felt this was the place where I had to be today was called Roda. Yeah. So, and I get this a lot from, from the discussion. No, no, I get it a lot because it's been don't even, may, may not even perceive how good this discussion is, at least for me, it's been fantastic from the first question on. Uh, <laughs> so here yeah, I come to my first point. Uh, we were saying the taxi when we came here, uh, why didn't I do a Heidegger seminar at Baroda? Just invite me to, well, whatever, just invite me to do one, okay? So, uh, and I cannot do that now. The short answer that I will give you is a very basic answer. Thank goodness I know the Gabriel book well, and I know him well too, and sort of like he's my best friend, so to speak. So I know the, I know the references yeah. that you refer to. Um, so I will start by saying that the concept and the topic of nothingness uh, in philosophy is not overestimated but I think people overtaxate or estimate its frequency. I think nothingness only comes up philosophically. I mean, I can only come up with two situations. I'm not saying it's categorically two, but there are very few as opposed to, I think, uh, the problem of philosophy in general and specifically today is more plenitude. Yeah, that we always have too much, too much complexity. I mean, I have a formula for that. I think we are at a stage where every day is morphing from a field of contingency, where contingency is surrounded by necessity, impossibility, to universe of contingency, where everything becomes contingent. Yeah. Um, so, and I mean, somebody like Gabriel, I think a very, very interesting uh, philosopher, when he says the world does not exist, uh, he of course means the philosophical concept of the world. 
and he means the conception of world that I have been invoking. And he is right, of course, because, I mean, if the world existed naturally, yeah, I mean, as this horizon of human existence, then we wouldn't need epics to stitch these different dimensions together. Yeah, I mean, the, the epic, I know it's the 20th century epic, and maybe today also film, etc., etc., they produce that world because that world does primarily not exist. I mean, this is, okay, so as a general statement, um, the problem is more a problem of plenitude and centrifugality uh, than uh, with nothingness and, em and, and emptiness. I also get the impression um, that within much of Asian or Eastern or whatever you want to call it, a philosophy, states of emptiness, at least in Buddhism, are an achievement, so not something that comes naturally. Now, uh, to make it into a Heidegger, beginning of a Heidegger workshop, um, the two motifs where nothingness appears in, in Heidegger's philosophy are, to my knowledge, only two. They are quoted with exuberant frequency, may be central in Heidegger's thought, but are not things that I mean, are brief intuitions. Uh, both of them, for me, have this goose flesh potential that prosody also has for me. So one of them is the famous passage from Being and Time where he criticizes a temporality that always goes into the future, criticizes things like, I'm doing this or that for my afterlife. And he says, well, what is after death? And by death, he means the end of consciousness. And he means, he says, nothing. And that means, and that is very hard to tolerate, um, that within all likelihood, I mean, even for agnostics, once you are dead and you are dead and I am dead, we'll not know that we are dead. <laughs> yeah. We'll not know that our grandchildren are regretting our death and we will not know that nobody reads the books that we hope with the uh, effect of great print runs and so forth. So that's nothingness. That is one dimension of nothingness. And if you let that sink in, it is pretty horrible. I also think it is pretty horrible because it is not given in the structure of consciousness to think that. Mm -hmm. If Husserl is right by saying that time is the structure of consciousness, that means that each present moment <coughs> is surrounded by a retention and a pretension, a protension, and we cannot, our consciousness cannot figure, cannot imagine a moment without protension. And the moment without protension would precisely be the moment of death. So, we have no way in our consciousness to imagine that type of nothingness. And that is one of the reasons why it's so terribly scary. The other one, the other intuition, is what Heidegger predicates as the origin of all philosophical thoughts. And that is the thought, also pretty scary, how come that there is something as opposed to nothing? I mean, how come that there is anything at all and most likely something as, I mean, unimaginably complex as the universe, or plurality of universes, as opposed to nothing. I mean, that is a question that we can ask as humans, and that is a question when, that you cannot ask without nothingness, without imagining the possibility that nothing would ever have existed nor happened. And I again think it has this good flash capacity, but it's a different kind of I mean, because the first food flesh is about how little we are somehow. <laughs> the other one uh, is for me the why would I fear that nothing could have existed? It is very strange, but but it is a very well, scary thing. Exist. Well, I think Heidegger, I interpret that he says that consciousness stops to exist, but the form changes. The smaller being gets aligned with the bigger being. But I want to actually want to keep the two questions apart. I think they're two different questions. Yeah. So I wanted to use them as an example. Yeah. That uh, it's just the curiosity to ask you questions. So. No, 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 no. Of course not, But uh, I wanted to use them as an example how 
one could continue both thoughts, but they would not necessarily be the same workshop, so to speak. But we could have a workshop on different concepts of nothingness and nothingness. Thank you. Thank you. So how about nothingness of the, of the discussion? I mean, I was... <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I swear, I mean, you have to trust me, I don't say, I don't say this always, and I haven't said it <coughs> a year and a half ago, this, this was one of the more exciting discussions I have ever triggered. And I want to thank you for that. Thank you.